Peace be upon you all and welcome to another uh, Seeing God in Biology session with uh, Dr. Faz Rana. Faz, how are you doing today? Ahmed, doing, doing great. How about you? All is well and um, we are going to talk today about DNA trans transcription, right? Yes, yes, we are. And uh, this is part of our ongoing series of episodes uh, on the central dogma, which is uh, part of a larger series of episodes about seeing God in biology. So yeah, we're working our way through the central dogma, and today we're going to be focusing on the production of uh, messenger RNA. All right, and this is this is the intermediate stage that we talked about uh, last session that is between DNA and eventually we have proteins, right? Yes, that's right. And uh, just to give uh, our audience uh, some context, here's a uh, uh, a, a slide I put together, kind of giving a, an overview of the central dogma. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the central dogma really is about the flow of information. Uh, DNA is storing the information that the cell needs to build itself and to direct its operation. And of course, when a cell divides, that information needs to be propagated to the, to the daughter cell. So that's the process of DNA replication, where DNA is using the, its information to make copies of itself. And so we mm -hmm. talked about DNA replication. And so now we're at the point where we're looking at how does that information in DNA get read and then utilized by the cell's machinery to make proteins, which are the, yep. the molecular machines that do all the work inside the cell. And, and so this process involves reading the DNA and then making a copy of that information in the form of a molecule that's related to DNA structurally, but is not identical, and that's called RNA. And then, of course, that RNA will then make its way to ribosomes where it's read and that information is converted into another format, uh, that of, of, of proteins. So this is describing the flow of information. So today we're going to be looking at, again, that, that process of transcription. So RNA is this uh, second, the alphabet that we said last session that is necessary to have a proper information processing system where one alphabet is more proper for data storage and another one is more proper for like execution. Uh, yes. uh, and we gave the parable of DNA being like the hard drive and RNA like the program already read in memory. Yes. Yeah, which is a very uh, apt and very powerful metaphor that I think really highlights the, the ingenuity of this process. This is not a, a random process. This is a, a process that has this deep-seated rationale that, that undergirds it. Now, now, you know, when we talk about transcription, uh, uh, there is um, there are actually uh, messenger RNA, sorry, RNA is produced, but there's three types of RNA that mm -hmm. are, are important for protein production messenger RNA, which contains the information needed to make uh, a, an individual protein chain. But then there's also RNA molecules called transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA that are playing a central role in the process of translation. So in the next episode, we'll, we'll talk about those RNA molecules, but they too are produced uh, through a process of transcription as well. And we'll wow. talk a little bit about some of the differences between transfer and, 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 and messenger, sorry, tra messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA uh, in, the, yeah. in the, the next and episode. I, I have a question for you about that. Um, is it possible or do you see it uh, practically uh, in, 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 in other living organisms or whatever that um, the ribosomal RNA, which is RNA, can it be produced from messenger RNA, or it has to come from DNA? It has to come from DNA. Uh, wow. So they, they, they are, uh, biochemists will refer to the fact that there are these transfer RNA genes and ribosomal RNA genes. And, and the, so the, the reason, yeah, the reason I'm asking you the question actually is I, I was just thinking this, if, if, if you need the ribosomal RNA to take the messenger RNA further and produce proteins, which this is what it does, right? And you can only have the ribosomal RNA from DNA, not from RNA, then how would have any living organism functioned in an RNA world? Because then RNA will just be a sitting duck, wouldn't it be? <laughs> 
Yeah, yes. I mean, you're, you're asking the, the, the right question that I think is exposing another uh, of the long list of intractable problems with an RNA world. And, and specifically, how do you transition from a, an RNA world to a, a DNA protein world? You know, the, you have to have these systems working in a highly integrative fashion, you know, from the very beginning for, you know, for uh, the emergence of, 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 of protein synthesis. So you're asking the absolute right question that is exposing, I think, a, a, a flaw in the RNA world, one of many. Yeah, it also strikes me to be very, 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 a very efficient way of design that uh, the, the, the language that will produce the protein, which is the RNA, the messenger RNA, is actually actually needs another kind of RNA, and both are coming from the DNA. So this is a system that is really exploiting all the functionality of RNA, right? So it has this intermediate level, and it's just using it left, right, and center, right? That's mRNA, right. tRNA, RNA, rRNA, right. and th right. that's that's really amazing. Yes, it is. You know, and um, you know the 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 tRNA is is sometimes called adapter RNA. And this, and actually, the tRNA is the physical instantiation of the genetic code, which we're going to talk about in a couple of more episodes. So, if you want to know where the genetic code actually resides in the cell, it's in the the tRNA molecules. And because they, that's where the genetic code uh, arises, and the code is specifying using you know coding triplets to specify different amino acids. The that that the molecules that instantiate the genetic code are binding amino acids and are ferrying them uh, to the ribosome, and the so, ribosome has is a massive complex of proteins and and RNA, and that that the interestingly enough the 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 um, the ribosomal RNA is actually uh, the portion of the molecule that invo is involved in the catalytic step to, to attach amino acids together to build protein chains, but it also is used to help position the messenger RNA precisely within the ribosome, you wow. know, taking advantage of the same kind of base pairing interactions that are used to not only uh, copy DNA to make more copies of DNA for DNA replication, but also to copy the DNA to make messenger RNA and that same base pairing rules are used in transfer RNA to bring the right, you know, uh, amino acid to the right place in the ribosome at the right time. And, and so you're right, you know, the, the, the properties of RNA are all being uniquely exploited uh, in these different steps of, of transcription and translation. So, so the DNA not only produces the secondary language, which is the mRNA, but it also produces the decoder machine for it or the uh, the one that's going to convert it to protein which is the rRNA and also produces the the code mapper which is the r uh, which is the tRNA the transfer RNA which which knows which three pairs form what codons that correspond to what so so now this transcription process is essentially giving the blueprint and the way to read it and the machine that's going to read it all in one step right yes yes. Yes, it's wow. it's absolutely a, yeah, it's it's mind blowing. Absolutely, <laughs> to say the absolutely. Least, right? can, can, this can also be seen as a kind of, let's say, sort of irreducible complexity that this system will not work without all those four parts. Yes, you know, like completely uh, built to work together, right? Yes, I mean, in a sense, er everything that you we talk are going to talk about mm -hmm. constitutes multiple irreducibly complex systems that then in turn are integrated in an irreducibly complex way. So it's, it's not just simply irreducible complexity, but it's, it's like a hierarchical and a highly integrative irreducible complexity where irreducibly complex systems are integrated with other irreducibly complex systems to form in and of itself an irreducibly complex system that again <laughs> integrates yeah. with other, you know, higher order irreducibly complex systems and it's it just goes on and on and on a hierarchy of integrated systems that are built to work with each other essentially yes yes wow. and yeah. and what happens at the lower levels is anticipating what's going to happen at the 
at the more uh, at the higher levels in that hierarchy, right? And so, it, you know, there there's enormous it, there's enormous amount of pre planning and forethought that is incorporated into this design. So obviously, when you see design that has foresight in it, it 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 is only the work of a superior engineering uh, uh, work, n no less. Yes. Yes. All right. So that was a great start, I guess. Uh, a very yeah. intriguing slide. <laughs> yeah. And, and so here's a, a slide showing now the structure of a gene. So a gene is a region of DNA that contains the information needed to make a single protein chain, or sometimes it's called a polypeptide chain. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this is now the information that the cell's machinery is reading to, to make messenger RNA. So ribosomal RNA and, and transfer RNA gene structures are are going to be a little bit different than this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now, this is showing, uh, again, in very, in a cartoon form, uh, essentially the three regions of, of a gene in prokaryotic cells. So now we're going to be ex exclusively talking about bacteria for a few minutes because th the concepts are comparable in eukaryotic cells and complex cells with a nucleus. But in bacteria, the systems are uh, simpler. And so this is a great way to introduce the concepts. Then we can see the complexity of how these are cached out in eukaryotic cells. Mm -hmm. It's really, in a sense, three regions uh, in, a, in a gene. Only one of those regions is actually copied. That's, that's the light blue region. That's called the transcribed region. And then there's what's called the promoter and the terminator regions. These are regions that are before and after the transcribed regions that are used by the cell's machinery uh, in order to begin the copying process. You just simply can't copy, you know, you, you can't just simply go to the beginning of the gene and start the copying process because you have to have machinery, as we'll see in a minute, that actually binds to the DNA and unwinds the DNA. So that binding and unwinding requires a, 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 a contact point uh, before you can actually read the region of the, of the DNA that has the information needed to make the, the protein. And then likewise, there's got to be a way for the machinery to know this is where everything stops. And, uh -huh. and so, so we have a promoter, the transcribed region, and the terminator region. And then when we look at the transcribed region, it also has three regions, the coding uh -huh. region proper, and then there's what's known as the upstream and the downstream regions that are un, uh, untranslated. But these are used at the ribosome to help the ribosome know where to begin reading the RNA and when to stop, <clears throat> excuse me, stop reading the RNA. So these are playing functional roles. It's just that they're not containing the information needed to specify the amino acid sequence to build the protein chains. So what, what, what is the UTR? It means untranslated region. All right. Okay. <laughs> so th those are uh, uh, like markers for um, the, the to come uh, ribosome to, to, to see them when it's actually processing the produced uh, right. RNA, right? Yeah. So what we'll see in the next episode is that when the messenger RNA is placed in the ribosome, it has to be placed in a precise location. And mm -hmm. so that the three, sorry, the, the, the five prime untranslated region is doing that work. It's, it's helping to place it and, and it, and it's interacting with the ribosomal RNA. that's part of the ribosome. So it's, it, it's, you're using base pairing interactions and there's spe a special region in that ribosomal RNA that will specifically bind to the untranslated region uh, wow. to, to, right. to do the positioning work. So right. the details are are ingenious, and you know are uh, the, the the details uh, are where God is in the details. <laughs> absolutely, I... absolutely, and it, it it also reminds me of you know uh, typical standards of communication systems, where when you are sending a message, it's uh, <laughs> uh, amazingly it's called messenger RNA. When you're sending a message, there's typically a trailer of 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 signal that says a message is coming. Ah. And then you send the message, 
And then at the end, there is typically another marker that says the message has ended. You know, otherwise uh, the receiver will not know what, what you're doing. And, and it's also a great way uh, so that the receiver will know that here is useful information that's going to come now. And then when there is the stop, then it knows that we will ignore what's coming next. Maybe it's noise, maybe it's something else. So, so th 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 this, this, this way is like, you know, uh, uh, an intelligence is communicating here. Yes. And, and the amazing thing about the integration also you're talking about is that it's preparing within transcription uh, what is going to come in translation. So another uh, example of what you have just mentioned about systems that have foresight for what is the next processing level, etc. Yes, yes. It, it, you know, and all of that, of course, you know, is hmm. exactly, you know, there's an ingenuity to it and a logic that is exploited in, in human designs. Yeah. And, and so to sure. me, it's eerie that that same logic is, is evident in the cell you know, yeah. particularly if this is just simply the outworking of an unguided process, it, it makes more sense to me that this is, again, the work of a mind Absolutely. for those very region, reasons. Now, the, the machine, the, the protein machine that is, uh, that is um, responsible for transcribing the RNA is something called R RNA polymerase. And, it, uh -huh. and you could think of it initially as, as kind of an analog uh, to, uh, to DNA polymerase, uh, where it, it reads the, uh, the DNA in the three prime, five prime direction and produces RNA in the five prime, three prime direction. So it's very similar. There is actually proofreading function in RNA polymerases, just like there is in DNA polymerases. And um, in prokaryotic cells, there's a single RNA polymerase enzyme. In eukaryotic cells, there's actually three RNA polymerases. RNA polymerase one, two, and three, cleverly named. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, where okay. number two is the one that reads the information needed to make messenger RNA. And then two, sorry, one and three are actually dedicated to making ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. So you, you actually have, uh, you know, dispersed function in eukaryotic cells uh, versus what, you know, in prokaryotic cells where it's a, a single RNA polymerase doing all the work. And yeah. um, what, what we'll see, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region. That, and when it binds there, it unwinds the, the DNA double helix uh, two full turns of the helix are unwound, creating this trans, what's called a transcription bubble that's analogous to the replication bubble that we see in DNA. So there's, again, these interesting analogies. Um, can, can I ask a question here? Yes. <clears throat> so um, let's, let's, let's paraphrase that. So to have RNA from DNA, you need the RNA polymerase to read the DNA into and, and produce the RNA, right? And the RNA polymerase is essentially a protein. Yes. Correct? Yes. And wh where did this protein come from? Because RNA has not been read, has not, has not been produced yet. If we are at the first transcription process ever that happened, let's assume right. this. We're rewinding time. We're at the first transcription process that has ever happened. No transcription happened before. So now we have the DNA. It's being transcribed by this RNA polymerase protein complex, right? Yeah. Into RNA. But to get protein, we need RNA to be there in the first place and to be, you know, translated by something, by the other ribosomes, a kind of an, an tRNA machinery, right. which we yes. also don't know where they came from. So where did the RNA polymerase protein complex come from? Well, I mean, in, in this, in effect, is the, the chicken and egg paradox uh -huh. that, that confronts origin of life researchers is that you can't have DNA without proteins and you can't have proteins without DNA. But what you're doing is you're expanding with your question, the chicken and egg paradox even further saying that you can't really even get the RNA intermediate you need to make proteins unless you already have proteins. So it's absolutely a, <laughs> right. So it's, it's a, it's a two tiered problem. And, yeah. and, 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 you, you know, we, we'll, we're, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll bring this up again in the next episode, but, 
it really points to a, an even greater problem, which uh, is the idea that you can't have proteins unless you have proteins. So wow. in order to make proteins, you need proteins. Okay. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's even making that chicken and egg problem even more severe. Absolutely. Because in order to get, you know, proteins, you have to have the protein RNA polymerase to read the DNA to make the messenger RNA. The ribosomes are made up of protein and RNA, right? And those proteins are playing really important roles. And then even once a protein begins to fold, you need proteins to help that protein, the proteins to fold. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know of any, any evolutionary mechanism that can generate a chicken and egg system, let alone one that again displays that this type of hierarchical structure to it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, it, right. it 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 gets better all the uh, with every step, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. So the case for a creator is really is really compelling, uh, Faz. Uh, this this information is is absolutely amazing. Thank you for it. So let's let's go ahead. Yeah. Well, and now, so here's a, a, an exp uh, a more detailed uh, model of the RNA polymerase uh, that is showing the different subunits. It's a, it's a large protein complex that is made up of a, what's called the core, uh, which consists of four subunits, two alpha subunits, and then a beta and a beta prime subunit. And, and then these are interacting to form the core. And then there's another portion of, of, the, um, uh, of the enzyme called the sigma subunit. And the sigma subunit is what's actually binding to the promoter. And in mm -hmm. fact, in bacteria, there are different types of sigma subunits that are used to bind to promoters that correspond to different genes. So, uh, so the sigma subunit does two things. One is, is it prevents the RNA polymerase from interacting with DNA uh, uh, a, a, in regions where there aren't promoters, if there wasn't mm. for the sigma subunit, the the RNA polymerase would have these um, um, these interactions randomly with different regions of the DNA. So the sigma subunit prevents that from happening, and at the same time increases the affinity of RNA polymerase for actually promoter regions. So it's it's doing both. Wow. It's both inhibiting and activating. RNA polymerase to make a very highly specific uh, binding of this, you know, of the promoter. And then the strength of the binding is also determined by the sigma subunit as it interacts with precise sequences in the promoter. Uh, so uh, some sequences, again, are, are bind more tightly than other sequences. And that actually in, in plays a role in the, the amount of RNA produced, the more tightly the binding the more RNA that's produced uh, for uh, for that particular uh, gene, and then uh, in bacteria, bacteria uh, respond to stress by uh, by producing certain or by transcribing certain genes that produce proteins that that help protect the bacteria from a stress from environmental stresses. Like if you heat a bacteria to high temperatures, there are proteins that are produced called heat shot proteins that help to keep proteins from denaturing. And mm -hmm. so you have special sigma uh, subunits that will actually only, only activate during a stress situation. And so wow. this is a way to, to keep those genes that aren't needed when the cell isn't under stress quiet. No reason to produce proteins if you don't need them. But then when those proteins are needed, it's all hands on deck. And so you're keeping other genes that are doing normal functions from actually being produced or being transcribed in those proteins from being produced so that in that stress response, those proteins that are being given, that are given priority are the ones that are going to rescue the cell uh, from that so, stress. So the way I've understood it is like this. Um, you cannot tr transcribe a gene unless a transcription uh, um, factor is there which is essentially, it needs the sigma for that specific uh, promoter that will transcribe that specific gene. And sometimes this um, is used in an automatic adaptive response. So the sigma for the gene that will help the cell 
to counteract a heat shock is itself activated at high temperatures. Yes. And then the, the promoter will, will, will enable the initiation of the production of those proteins. And when the temperature goes away, those sigmas will be deactivated. And then you don't need those proteins anymore. And maybe the proteins are dissociated or um, metabolized or degraded somehow. And the bacteria will just go back to normal life. Uh, is that a good yes. example? Excellent. Excellent. Wow. So, <laughs> and, 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 and this means that even the process of, 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 of gene transcription isn't just like, you know, transcription is happening you know, like haphazardly all the time. Those, those are activated whether by environmental conditions or maybe even, um, I, I guess, sometimes by signaling or, or a yes. sort of signaling between cells or in a bigger right. organism, between organs or uh, 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 et cetera, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so you 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 know again we're focusing on bacteria at this moment, but you know in a, in a cell there are genes that are going to be needed almost all the time. These are called housekeeping genes, and so these are always expressed. And then there's going to be genes that only are needed, or the information in those genes is only needed at certain times, and and so these are inducible genes. Where, the, where there's environmental signals. And we'll see an example of, of a classic system towards this end that's found in bacteria called the lac operon, you know, wow. where when those genes are needed, there are mechanisms to turn those genes on. And, and, wow. and that those mechanisms are working through transcription factors that are working in conjunction with the RNA polymerase. Uh, so it's a collaborative effort. Um, wow. So anyway, we, we've, we've kind of made this point, but uh, basically uh, there are what are called cons uh, two sites within the promoter that where the RNA polymerase specifically binds, and these are called consensus sequences. And mm -hmm. in other words, these are sequences that, are, that have certain characteristics associated with them that might vary from gene to gene or from organism to organism, but that variation is actually controlling the strength of the binding uh, wow. uh, of, the, of the sigma subunit and therefore the amount of transcription that happens. Uh, and, and, um, and so here's a, a more detailed uh, depiction of, the, of a gene in a typical prokaryotic cell where we have uh, on the left-hand side just DNA that is of, of part of the DNA molecule, but of, is not of interest for us at the moment. There's the promoter region, and in the promoter region, there are these two uh, regions that are called consensus sequences, where the RNA, again, polymerase binds, the sigma subunit specifically. Then mm -hmm. you have the coding region, the termination region, and then there's more DNA that is not of interest for us at this point in time. And again, when you see the transcript, there are untranslated regions in the five prime end and the three prime end that are related to what's happening at the ribosome. Uh, but the point of this slide is to show that it, within the promoter region, there are these highly sensitive regions where you, you're getting this interaction and they're separated in space uh, by about 20 base pairs, meaning that there's actually interaction uh, at two, again, there are two binding sites in the RNA polymerase that is interacting specifically with the with the DNA. Amazing, amazing. And proka prokaryotes are the simplest of the simplest, right? Yeah, Those yes. Those are the simplest things that, that, that are living. Yes. And this is how complex it is. I exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, now that we talked about the sigma subunit being uh, playing a role in uh, binding to the promoter, there's another subunit that is used called the row subunit that helps to terminate the process. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, and there's, there's uh, two aspects to this termination. One is that the row subunit recognizes that this is the time to end the transcription and it helps to, uh, for the RNA polymerase to disengage from, uh, from the DNA and also to kind of um, stop the, the, the uh, transcription process. But that in addition to that, there's also in the termination region of the gene, a, a palindromic sequence, which actually means that the, 
you know, a, you know, a palindromic sequence would be like a g g t g g a. So it's it's right. like it's like an inverted sequence where it. But what's interesting about that type of sequence is that that single strand of DNA will actually base pair with itself as a result of that informs what's called a, a hairpin structure. So you can sort of see that in the, in this slide, but there's another slide that shows it more, more clearly where you have the RNA polymerase going along and then it encounters the termination signal where you can see if you look closely the palindromic sequence so that when that, that double heat region of the double helix unwinds, now the single strands will pair with themselves and that forms a hairpin, which is an obstruction that forces the, again, the RNA uh, polymerase to disengage. And again, the, the row protein is, is facilitating this process. Uh, wow. it, 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 um, although you can, can actually have termination independent of the row protein uh, so there's they, there's a discussion of row dependent and row independent termination of genes, and I'm not quite sure I I, I, I know en enough about that particular aspect of the process of transcription to tell you what the difference is and 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 what the significance of that is. I just have not ever really uh, put put the effort into to to studying that in detail. But anyway, but, but what what you're saying is that. The, the, the end, there is a sequence that is written in a way that will force the DNA, the unwound DNA strand to form a physical structure that will cause a halt. This is the end of the train railway, okay? Yes. And at yes. the end of the train railway, just the steel is bent in a way yep. that the carriage cannot go forward. It's, it, this is mind-blowing. Right. And, and, and this series uh, of, of, of codons or of uh, actual nucleotides is made in a way so that it is as if the, 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 the two complementary, the, the other complementary strand is actually repeated here so that when it's uh, denatured, it will, it will fold on itself. And, and, and what you're saying is that this, what did you call it, palindromic yes. uh, yeah, uh, uh, sequence, if it occurs by coincidence, in the middle of the gene, it will cause the gene to terminate, right? Yes, yes. But it magically, <laughs> magically, it always occurs at the right place. Yes. Right? And at every right place it occurs. So, so, so very clear indication of nothing is by coincidence at all. No, it, it's not. And, wow. you know, yeah. And, you know, so it, it's, you're looking at these in, systems that are not only complex, the complexity to me is almost, you know, everywhere. It, it's everywhere. It, yeah. But it's that, that there is a, an elegance and a sophistication to the, to the design of these systems, but it's also a, 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 an incredibly high precision where things are so exacting, you know, and that if there's any deviation, uh, you, for example, even a mutation in the DNA in that if the mutations are significant, or, uh, accrue in that termination sequence, that becomes a real problem as well because yeah. it disrupts the palindrome. And if you disrupt the palindrome sufficiently, you're not going to get the hairpin structures forming. So this is a, even though it's not coding information specifically to make a protein, it's still a very sensitive region of the gene. Uh, in terms of, of, again, susceptibility to mutation in the same way that the promoter region would be as well. Wow. Uh, uh, this is totally uh, unbelievable. All right. So uh, so we know now that the termination uh, process is not just information coded, but information takes a physical form. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Completely mind-blowing. All right. Now, here's a, a, another depiction of the RNA polymerase. And what I want to emphasize here is the, the machine-like nature of, of this protein complex. You know, uh, for example, if you look uh, where you have the solid light blue and light green helix, that is a, a region that is upstream where the RNA polymerase is moving in that direction. That's what it's about to transcribe. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it and it actually is held in place by these jaws. So that the, the RNA polymerase literally binds <laughs> to the DNA double helix and has these jaws that hold hold on to the double helix. And wow. and and so that forms a, a jaw-like structure where you have a channel that accommodates the DNA double helix. And then you have the region where you're, you're opening it up to get to the transcription bubble. And you see in that region that, 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 that um, the uh, single-stranded DNA is held in place by a clamp now so that you know, it's, it would be similar to the single-stranded binding proteins that you see in DNA. It helps to you know, hold on to the DNA, hold it in, in the right position, but also stabilizes the single-stranded DNA. And then you see the RNA is being produced. RNA is the, the red, the, the red uh, uh, structure, the red ribbon. And then there's a funnel region where the nucleotides are being fed, you know, into the into the uh, function into into the the uh, the cavity where the transcription process is taking place. So this is wow. how those the nucleotides are being fed in. This and is the this is the the the. The, the entrance uh, uh, down below that it's a uh, small yes. funnel and NTPs it's uh, yes. is, is is written there yeah yeah okay. so these are the single you know nucleotides that are being put in place based on the the, the Watson Crick base pairing rules that are used right. to, to build the the gene or, or sorry to transcribe the gene and then um, we see a rudder which is a region that helps as the RNA is produced helps to direct it towards an exit so that uh -huh. it can exit the the rna polymerase as it's being produced and there's a lid that keeps that rna chain from from diffusing back into the champ into the cavity where the transcription process is taking place so you you have the unbelievable you you have the the rna being guided out and uh, out of the 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 protein complex and again you know a lid that kind of like a valve to keep any kind of backflow from happening. And so to me, it, this is, a, 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 it, it's eerie in the fact that it's, it's, it bears a similarity to the types of machines that we would build. If you were going to build, if you had a, a DNA double helix that you were going to copy a model of it and you, you want to build a machine that would automatically copy it, you would probably incorporate these kinds of, of this, you know, mechanical, systems into that into that machine and so this literally is a is a, a machine in every sense of the word you know a but lot of times this, this is actually a machine that is just a molecule yes it is yes. essentially a set of of proteins that right. each one is a molecule and they are coming right. together right. into a, a, a bigger molecule so the whole thing is just a molecule right and, and, you know, we've not talked about this, but maybe we should do an episode in the future on just the molecular machines inside the cell. But, you know, a lot of times biochemists will use the, this language, and I do as well, the cell's machinery. And they're really using it in, in kind of a, in, an, in a very loose way. It, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just a, 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 a you know, a, a, a kind of an artful way of describing the proteins in the cell. But there are proteins in the cell that are machines in every sense of the word. And this is an example of, of one of them. Absolutely. And to me, this really gives some very strong uh, energy to the, to the watchmaker argument. You know, because William Paley was comparing, you know, human-made designs with bio the designs in biological systems. And he was arguing that you know, based on the similarity of the designs, we could infer that a creator must be responsible for biology. And that argument was dismissed in large part because people like David Hume and others said, well, it's an analogy and you're just taking the analogy too far. Really? This, was, this is kind <laughs> of a... But when we start talking about machines, we're not just simply, this is not just an analogy that we're using in a loose way. This literally is a machine with the same kind of components that we would use to build a machine. And this is just one of hundreds of machines like this. And so, you know, it's not that this isn't an analogy for a machine. 
it literally is is a machine you know Absolutely. that 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 is um, again you know uh, reading uh, the the dna and then producing a physical copy of information in the dna uh and uh and we actually have a, a video that we're going to show that that really when you watch when our viewers watch that video just pay attention to the machine like nature of Absolutely. how that that process of transcription is happening and you can actually in the video see that the nucleotides going into the funnel and coming out is the is the the pristine rna chain absolutely, absolutely. it's an it's an amazing video and, uh, and 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 fuzz machines need power they need they need a power right. source what's powering this thing uh this is driven by um a molecule called the hydrolysis of a molecule called atp in fact a large number of atp molecules so for every every nucleotide that's added to the the to the uh, to the to the RNA chain, the growing RNA in a chain, you are in effect utilizing breaking what are called two high energy uh, phosphate bonds or, or phosphoanhydride linkages, um, and, and and so these are on a molecule called ATP, which is a an, an energy molecule. It's a fuel molecule that the cell uses, uh, just like in a, in your automobile, you know the the uh, the hydrocarbons that are used, the octane and the isooctane that's used to power automobiles is being literally chemically broken down ultimately into CO2 and to water. Likewise, you're taking a fuel molecule and you're breaking it down and you're releasing uh, energy that is then used to drive this reaction. So this is a, an energy intensive process that requires and the breakage of two phosphoanhydride linkages. So, um, so, the, so, so this machine is not only built from integrated proteins, but also the machine is integrated with the power system of the cell. It's built to interact with ATP, ADP right. conversion to harvest the energy it needs just at the right place so that it will take in the nucleotide with right. some, with, with a bite of energy and then do its work and, and ATP is just flowing around it, right? It's, it's yes. Yes. Yeah. So, how come the cell does not burst because of of of, of all the chemical waste? Where does the uh, ATP waste, which is ADP, I think, where does it go? And why why oh, doesn't oh, the cell just explode I mean, from I mean, the waste? The, yeah. The, I mean, the the uh, the the spent nucleotides uh, are actually uh, recycled. <laughs> so yeah. uh, they're they're. I'm you know, asking actually about the ADP, the 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 the, the waste fuel. Where, yeah. where does all those ADPs go? They are they are in the cytoplasm of the of the the bacterial cell, but then they are as the cell is is breaking down other organic materials to power the cell's operation. It's using that to to reform ATP. Actually, in um, uh, ATP is used as a fuel source, but also in addition to that, the the nucleotides like the uh, uh, uracil. And, and cytosine and guanine are, are being delivered as a nucleotide triphosphate. So they, they are, in effect, analogs to ATP. So when those are incorporated into the chain, the source of the high energy, uh, the high energy phosphoanhydrides is actually coming from the individual nucleotides itself. So there's actually wow. two sources of, of energy. One is that the energy that's stored in the the four different nucleotides that are used to make RNA, but there's also ATP hydrolysis going on as well. But what you're saying is that this ATP, when it's used, there is also another cycle to recycle the ADP into new ATP through metabolic right. processes, whatever. So, so, so cells are not really polluting anywhere, anything, right? It's just doing its work, very clean recycling process. Everything is magnificently right. integrated and it just goes on. Right. And, and, you know, the, the, the waste of the pro of process would be heat, and that diffuses away from the cell. And then ultimately, the ultimate waste would be carbon dioxide because there's organic compounds that are being broken down, <clears throat> and that energy is then being used to drive the formation of ATP. So in a sense, ATP is, the, is a, a fuel molecule that is like a, an energy currency for the cell, right? Wow. Uh, so that it's a, it's a single... A pool of molecules that are used to drive 
cellular operations as opposed to a wide range of different organic materials, uh, it, it's a it's a, an, a really elegant economic system that allows uh, for you know fuel to be provided. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, right. So, uh, it, it, you know, so it would be similar to, uh, you know, to, to um, well, like we use electricity, for example, to to power our homes. Well, that electricity is generated from wind energy, from solar energy, burning coal, where, you know, you're turning turbines, water energy. So you're taking these different energy sources that would be impractical to use to power the, the, the appliances in your home, and you're converting it all into electricity, which is a single type of, uh, of energy that can then be universally used to power everything going on inside your home. Similar concept inside the cell where organic materials are being broken down and that energy is being converted, uh, you know, in the, uh, through the electron transport chain to make ATP molecules uh, that are then used to, to power all the cells operations. Uh, amazing. So anyway, amazing. yeah. Now, something else that I think is, is fun when we think about the machine like nature of RNA polymerases is, is that it also is analogous to not only kind of a, a, the types of mechanical machines that we would build, but it's also analogous to an abstract machine that is the heart of, of computer systems. And so this is a, my attempt. A Turing at, computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but literally what you're looking at is a, is a Turing, is the RNA polymerase is a, is a Turing machine, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there is there is an input, there is an input tape and and and, and there is an output and, and there is a function that does the conversion and and it is just working and there is a halt. There is a halt process that stops the the Turing machine, which is very important in 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 the the whole paradigm. And you know, it it, it, it gets an instruction to start, read, produce the output, and then stop. It is is it, it it is the complete fulfillment of the model, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, in in you know, in the Turing machine is handling digital information, and you can think of the DNA and the RNA as digital information because they're discrete, uh, discrete units uh, of absolutely. information, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, and what's mind-boggling is that this, to me is that this is an abstract machine. This is not, you know, th that Turing when he invented this machine was creating an abstract you know, entity that, that, that helped him to think theoretically about how computer systems could operate. But what we're seeing with RNA polymerase is a physical instantiation of this abstract mach machine. So yeah. again, fun absolutely. stuff. Yes. Uh, uh, very, very, absolutely. All right. Okay. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we're going quite a, quite long here so we'll, we'll we'll bring this thing to a close but we're having a good time this is a uh, a picture of a uh, of something that i think many people would be familiar with and this is a essentially a a dimmer switch so you can turn on and turn off lights in your home but then if with the dimmer switch you can increase or decrease the intensity of the light and so this mm -hmm. is a, a very elaborate you know system you know if you think about it it's a a very sophisticated, you know, engineered system. And this is exactly what's happening in terms of gene regulation. Mm -hmm. Is that is that through uh, the binding of RNA polymerase that will turn at a promoter site that is essentially turning on and turning off the binding and the debinding is turning on and turning off the RNA polymerase machine. But you also have a mechanism that will, uh, you know, regulate the amount of again, RNA that's produced by the strength of the binding, but the point here is that this is again a very you know sophisticated way of of uh, of, of regulating uh, the output in response to the environment. If it's bright outside, you don't need a lot of light in the room, but if it's dark outside, you need a lot of light, and so you can control the amount of light that's in the room so through that that type of dimmer switch. So the strength of binding will, will, will cause what? So essentially, 
at the end of the day, one transcription produces one mRNA or one RNA strand, right? Right. So what happens if the binding is 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 strong? It will just do more rounds of it, or how would that work? Right. It it's kind of a statistical effect. So, um, you know, because you have a lot of you know a lot of RNA polymerases in the cell, right? And and so those RNA polymerases, once a gene is transcribed, well, another RNA polymerase will come along and bind and transcribe that gene again. And uh -huh. so the more, the the stronger the binding, the more copies of RNA are going to be produced. The, the weaker the binding, the fewer numbers are going to be produced. But, okay. but, but of course, if you want to turn, turn everything off, you, there's, there's actually an on-off switch for, uh, for some genes. And, right. and that on-off switch is what we're going to talk about now, where you can actually prevent RNA polymerase from binding or encourage RNA polymerase to bind. And, so what, and what, what determines, what, what can circumstantially determine the dimmer effect? What can circumstantially determine the strength of the binding? Uh, this would, this would be the, the, well, that, that would be the, the, the precise sequences in that, in those two consensus sequences in the promoter region. So the precise sequence will determine the strength of the binding. Some sequences will bind more strongly, RNA polymerase will bind more strongly to some sequences than, than to other sequences. So, so the promoter region is not just only saying start, but start and produce that much copies statistically. Yes, if, yes. If you start doing this gene, then typically do 100, 100, 100 uh, uh, mRNAs. If it's that other gene, and that other uh, sequence, uh, 50 is okay, et cetera. So as yeah. as either do or don't, it's do, and that's how, man, uh, that's how much. Yes, yes. Wow. So, so it's very sophisticated. But, but then in, there, there's also systems in place to turn on and turn off genes completely uh, in response to, to uh, happenings in the environment. And so what I want to show you now is, is a, a classic example of, gene regulation in prokaryotic cells. It's called the, the LAC operon, and you'll understand why it's called that in a minute. But mm -hmm. uh, there's a sugar, a disaccharide called lactose. This is milk sugar. Mm -hmm. And uh, bacteria will consume uh, uh, the milk sugar, lactose, if it's available in the environment. But if it's, not, it's a rare sugar, so uh, usually the genes that are needed to, to break down uh, lactose are not, or and to, to make use of lactose are usually not expressed because if lactose isn't in the environment, why make those particular genes? But if it is in the environment, well, then we should make the genes so that we can take advantage of it. And there's a, an enzyme called beta galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into galactose and glucose. And once that happens, the, the cell's metabolic systems are, are there to process those, those two sugars. So the wow. key enzyme is this beta-galactosidase. Well, it turns out that beta-galactosidase is on, uh, you know, is encoded in the gene of, of let's say, the bacterium E. coli. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a, a two other genes that are involved in getting that the lactose into the cell. These are uh, genes that are uh, one, one's called a permease, which will transport the lactose from the environment into the cell. And then there's another gene that is involved in this process, but nobody quite knows what it is. And these three genes are, are located right beside each other. And that's called an operon. Whenever you have genes in a bacterial genome that are located side by side by side, they're called an operon. And typically, the genes that are working collaboratively to carry out a specific function in the cell are all located right next to each other. And in fact, they are usually transcribed as a, oper as a unit so that, that wow. all three genes are transcribed at the same time. And then while they're being transcribed, ribosomes are actually reading those genes even before they're completely transcribed so that translation can begin simultaneously with transcription. Wow. But the, but what this means is that if lactose is present in the environment, all three of these enzymes that are needed to process lactose are simultaneously produced 
so that everything that you need to carry out that operation is all is present at the same time. Right. Wow. So so it's a very elegant it's a very elegant design. So then here is the, the the three genes together. They form a three separate genes that are part of a single coding unit uh, called again the lac operon because it's involved in the breakdown of lactose. You have here is the let's ignore this little half donut for a minute. Mm -hmm. We have the promoter region, right? And here's where the RNA polymerase binds in the promoter region. But an independent of this lac operon is another gene that when it's transcribed will produce a protein called a repressor. And that repressor will bind to what's called an operator, which is right adjacent to the promoter. And when that repressor binds the operator, even though RNA polymerase can bind, it physically can't access the gene. So it's it's hey. essentially turning the gene, the, the, oh. the, turning the transcription process off. Uh, and or sometimes these these repressors will prevent RNA polymerase from actually binding. It, it might actually uh, physically occlude, you know, the, the the sites in the promoter where the RNA polymerase is binding. Um, this so th so this repressor will normally bind to um, to the promoter region or the uh, sorry the operator region, uh, keeping the lac operon from being expressed, being transcribed. Because again, there's no lactose in the environment. But let's uh. say there's lactose that that starts to appear in the environment, and some of that lactose will make its way oops into the cell, mm -hmm. will make its way into the cell. And when it does that, it'll actually interact with the um, with the repressor. And when it does interact with the repressor, it prevents it from binding. And now, as long as lactose is present, the lac operon will be transcribed and the three enzymes that you need to metabolize lactose will be produced. And as soon as the lactose level drops in the environment, that debinding between the repressor and lactose will take place and the repressor can then re-engage at, at the operator, turning the gene off. And so here wow. you have this really elegant on-off switch. And, and so this is, uh, again, uh, one way, one mechanism for, again, uh, you know, it, controlling gene expression. This, this, is completely, this is completely amazing. It actually reminds me of the Lensky experiment, too. But in the, uh, I remember in the Lensky experiment, it was even more crazy because uh, what you have described about having those transport mechanisms and then uh, they starved the cells from glucose and they had citrate instead of it. Yes. And, and the machinery in the cell to metabolize citrate is all there, but the transport part is not available in the operon. Yeah. And then uh, they thought at first it was just a random mutation, but then later, I guess, they, they, they found that um, sort of a transposon, a part of the genome has just jumped and, and, and put itself with the operon, but now uh, uh, giving it the ability to transport in citrate. And once citrate came in, the whole process for, of citrate metabolism kicked in. So while this, while this one is totally crazy, it even says that there are <laughs> crazier things that oh, are yeah. happening. This is a relatively simple one. There are, are some of these operons that have activators as well as repressors and are responding to multiple signals in the environment. You know, so it's, it's, this, is, this is probably one of the simpler uh, you know, examples of, of gene regulation, but it, it's communicating, I think, some very powerful concepts. But again, you know, you're, you're looking at a system that is you know, irreducibly complex, that is a, a highly you know, integrative system, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, uh, you know, what comes first, the repressor gene or the operon gene, the genes that are part of the operon, right? They both need to be present simultaneously, you know, and functioning in, in the precise way, right? And uh, Absolutely. so, Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's uh, again, you know, I see it as an incredibly elegant. Uh, it, it also reminds me of something that we, we typically use in electronics, it's called a negative feedback loop. Yes. And, 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 and systems that are based on negative feedback, essentially they essentially converge to stability. 
and and they would always have a measurement system at the output and it compares it to a target level and as long as this comparison is it derives the signal that now drives the input and and the loop is closed and what you are essentially showing us here is is an, an immensely elegant feedback loop where there is a continuous measurement of the level of lactose and and when lactose is abundant uh, the process would proceed until uh, uh, the, the lactose is consumed and then it will essentially control the input to quench the, the, the process itself that consumes the lactose so it eventually stabilizes into a halt and then when there is new lactose coming in it 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 will it will now statistically accelerate again until it consumes it and then it deaccelerates. So this is this is essentially an electronic circuit that is that is self-stabilizing and self-convergent because it has an, a, a geniusly engineered uh, negative feedback system. Yeah. Do you agree to that? Oh yeah, that's yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing, yeah, amazing, yeah. And 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 again, the integration of the repressor that the repressor would actually um, is engineered to actually bind to the molecule that it would give way to metabolize is again another kind of foresight where the input and output of the the the, the input the input controls of the system. Uh, for think or foresee the outputs and and it's all interacting together again in a very efficient and elegant way so this is this is super amazing it is okay fuzz i think that was super wonderful understanding how transcription works in prokaryotes and now i'm i'm really i'm really perplexed if this can be really even more complex than what we have shown us so uh, this will uh, take us into this coming installment where we'll actually look into how transcription happens in eukaryotes. So for the audience, please give us your comments here. And, and, and Foss, thank you very much for this super exciting episode. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a lot of fun. <laughs> thanks a lot. So peace be upon you all and see you again soon.